Hey guys, and welcome to my Lord Maruga guide. My video guides are not going to be super long videos, as I'm making these videos the way I would like to watch a video guide, which is about a 3 to 5 minute video depending on the boss, explaining the mechanics and giving me a good strategy to use for the boss. So if that is what you are looking for, you have come to the right place. All strategies in my video guide will be the strategies my guild and I use during the world first classic progression. Lord Maruga has a cleave. The cleave damage is split among people it hits, so you want at least two tanks to stand on top of each other. If you are undergeared, you can do three tanks to make it safer. The boss will not instantly cleave on pull or after a bone storm, so it gives you like a grace period before it happens. Lord Maruga will make trails of fire come out from him. These trails of fire spawn on players, so if the casters in melee stand a bit out, the melee can stand underneath the boss basically to avoid a lot of ticks. The interval of fire spawn seems to be about every 10 seconds from re reviewing all of my footage. Lord Maruga will every 15 seconds cast an ability called Bone Spike, where three random raid members get impaled and they need to be broken out. The spikes only have about 113,000 HP, so if you stack they die really fast from cleave. Maruga's biggest ability is Bone Storm, which happens approximately 45 seconds into the pull. He will become a big blade storming warrior dealing AoE damage to the entire raid. However, the closer you are to him, the more damage you take. During Bone Storm, Maruga will randomly go to either two of the targets first away from him. So how we do it in my guild is that the two tanks are baiting Bone Storm on one side of the room, and a hunter and a holy paladin is baiting on the other side of the room together, and then have the entire raid stand in between these two points so all the rains lose no uptime on the boss in this phase. When Maruga reaches a target during blown, bo, bl, doing his uh, bone storm ability, he will shoot out four lines of fire in every 90 degree of him. These are fairly easy to dodge, though as long as he does not stop on top of your raid but rather on the baiter standing far away. And that's about it for Maruga. I'll see you in the next video. Lady Death Whisper has two phases. Phase 2 will begin once you've done enough damage to her to break her mana barrier. 5 seconds into the pull, and after that every 45 seconds, the boss is going to spawn 6 adds, 3 on each side of the room. How we handle these adds is to have a tank assigned to each side and pick up 3 adds each. These adds can turn into mobs that will be immune to either physical or magical damage. I am sure there will be public regards to instantly show you which one it is. The adds can also cast the Dark Martyrdom. When this happens you want to be away from that ad as it explodes for heavy damage. 30 seconds into the pull, Dominate Mind will happen. When this happens, three random raid members become mind controlled, so it's important that Right before this happens you stop AoE and you don't put like death and decay on the ground to kill these people. Safest way to handle the mind controls is stuff like the cyclone, making them immune to damage and uh, after the first mind control it will happen again every 40 seconds. When phase 2 begins we usually have our prod paladin start and pump as high as he can and then naturally have our DK tank take over about 30% in. The DK tank is the perfect tank for this boss, as with a portion of Sansa speed, he can kite the boss around the room and keep outranging the attacks that causes the tank to generate less threat. And being a DK, you can generate a large amount of threat from range spamming Icy Touch and having tricks and misdirections funneled into you. The DK tank can also use anti-magic shield to absorb frostbolt hits whenever it's up to generate large amount of runic power for threat as well. Frostbolt should be kicked when anti-magic shield is on cooldown. During the entirety of phase 2, spirits will spawn around the room and fixate onto targets. If they get too close to that target, they will explode in a large AoE for heavy damage. This is the only mechanic you need to be scared of. As long as you dodge the spirits, you kill the boss. Lastly. In phase 2, only 3 adds spawn every 45 seconds. The way we handle this 
is to have the off tank pick up the ads and try to drag them under the boss as much as possible so they can be dotted slash cleaved down and we prioritize killing these ads over doing boss damage. I hope the guide was useful. Best of luck in Ice Crown Citadel guys. Hello guys, just a quick little gunship video here. Now gunship is, is notoriously easy, but if you have never done it before, it is nice to know how it works. Your ship will have an NPC where you can start the fight. This NPC will also give you a rocket shirt that you can equip to use and jump around. This will be used to jump to the enemy's ship. Remember to equip it before combat or you will not be able to use it. Your ship have four cannons that you need to man. Pressing the one in the cannon will do 1500 damage to the enemy ship and build up energy. If you reach 100 energy, your cannon will overheat and be stunned while you lose all your energy. So try to use ability number two at around 90 energy for maximum damage. These cannons can target the riflemen in the back of the other ship, so your raid takes less damage. Whenever the enemy ship summons a sorcerer, your main tank jumps to the other ship, with the rest of the DPS following a second after. The main tank tanks the boss on the other ship while your DPS focuses on the sorcerer that stuns your cannons. When the sorcerer is dead, you jump back to your ship. Your off tank can pick up the ads that spawn on your boat, and while there's no sorcerer, they kill these ads. And that's basically all you need to know for gunship, boys. Enjoy! Deathbringer Salfang is basically a DPS and healing chick. You want to kill him before he puts out too many marks of the falling champion. Deathbringer Salfang will mark a random raid member with mark of the fallen champion when he reaches 100 energy. If a Tark dies with this mark on them, Salfang will heal for 20% of his total HP. Whenever this happens, it's usually a wipe. Salfang has a built-in tank swap mechanic by the ability Rune of Blood. He will cast Rune of Blood on the target tank and the off tank needs to taunt off immediately. Rune of Blood will make Salfang hit harder on the target and generate more energy. About every 15 seconds, Salfang will cast the Boiling Blood on three random targets except for tanks, making them take physical damage over time and generate energy for Salfang. How we handle these is use Hand of Protection on targets that gain them over using it on Mark of Fallen Champion to slow down the energy regeneration of Salfang. About every 20 seconds, Saofang will cast a Blood Nova on a ranged player, dealing damage to the target and everyone within 12 yards of the target. And once again, Saofang gains energy based on the total damage being done. Because of this, every range wants to spread out at least 12 yards between them. About every 40 seconds, Saofang will spawn 5 Blood Beasts that have 127,000 health each in 25 man heroic. These Blood Beasts will take 95% reduced AoE damage, so they need to be focused by single target abilities. Usually the highest damage on these adds are Affliction Warlocks with Corruption spamming. In our raids, we have our Affliction Warlocks stand closest to the melee to be able to reach all the Blood Beasts spawn and of course be in range of tricks from the rogues. The way my guild handles these Blood Beasts is by putting down a Frost Trap from the hunter before they spawn to slow them. Around 2 seconds after they have all spawned, our boomkin will knock them back with Typhoon. After the knockback and they have come to the middle-ish of the platform, we have assigned stuns from the paladins in the raid onto the blood beast. And we have our paladins play the talent to reduce the cooldown on Hammer of Justice so they can stun every wave. It is important to not let these blood beasts melee you at all costs. So it's important melees do not over aggro these, as they will most likely one shot you if they are alive for more than 10 seconds and then generate a lot of energy for Saofeng. If the blood beasts are not dead after the paladin stun, we have assigned people in melee to taunt specific beasts back onto the plot platform so they don't kill the ranged players. Last ability to talk about is Mark of the Fallen Champion and how we handle it in our raid. In our guild, we have the Holy Paladins fully focused healing only the Mark of the Fallen Champion when we get the third and fourth mark. 
meaning only our Resto Shaman and this priest is healing the tank at this point. Our aim is to always kill Saurfang right after the fourth mark happens, or it's just getting too tough too fast. There are ways to cheese it by hardstoning out of the raid, using DI with the mark, but we chose not to do any of these, so I'm not certain exactly how it works. I hope the guide was useful. Best of luck in Icecorn Citadel, guys. On Rodface, you want to always have at least 8 players not in melee of him. If you don't have that, the vile gas can be targeted on melee and it will pretty much be an instant wipe. Vile gas will disorient you and deal damage to surrounding players. Around every 20 seconds, Putricide will make the ooze tanks flow at a random section of the room and cover it in green slime. It's again important that the people standing where the slime is spawning don't go into melee, so you have less than 8 people in range. Rodface will occasionally do a slime spray in a frontal targeting a random player in the raid. If you are standing in melee of him, just go behind him during this and you're completely fine. If you're in range getting hit by it, you can dodge it as well, just make sure you don't stack on other ranged because of the vile gas. The main mechanic on this boss is mutated infection. A random player will get infected by mutated infection and after 12 seconds they will spawn a small ooze. The first small ooze you basically just ignore and let it hit the player it spawned on. Just heal the player a bit more. When the second ooze spawns you want to bring them together and they will form a big ooze. This big ooze is now tauntable and will be kited around in the outer ring, outer ring by the yaw off tank. We found DK tanks to be great at this. Do not be tanking hits though from the big ooze as an off tank, just kite it. The oozes have a pulsing AoE around them, so if you see an ooze going to be kited onto you, dodge it to reduce the rate damage taken. Any following mutated infection, you should try to stand on the off tank when it times out, so the small ooze is close to the big ooze and it will merge again with the big ooze. Small oozes are not tauntable, so it's individual responsibility to make them merge. When the big ooze absorbs a fifth small ooze to have five stacks of unstable ooze on it, it will begin to channel a forcing an ability called Unstable Ooze Explosion. When the cast is done, the big ooze will explode and send off small ooze explosions to the position of where every player was standing in the room. How we try to manage this ability in our raids is to pre-clear an open area where the main tank can drag the boss into so everyone is safe. TLDR of this explosion though is just go to a place where no one was standing when the explosion happened. The explosion is approximately 6 yards. And that's about it for Rodface. Rodface have a soft enrage timer though, as in he starts to cast mutated infection more often the longer the fight goes on. So you will get overrun eventually. Our guild aims it to kill it a bit after the second big ooze explosion and if the boss is fairly low at this point, which approximately 15-20% HP, we usually ignore every new ooze that spawns and just let them attack the player they spawn on while just focusing down the boss. I hope this video was useful and good luck in Icecrown Citadel. Pestergod is a fairly simple fight from a guide perspective, so I won't waste your time. There is five abilities you need to know for this fight. The first ability is Gastric Bloat. This debuff will make the active tank do more damage, stacking up to 10 times and lasting 100 seconds. However, if the tank reaches 10 stacks, he instantly dies and kills anyone around him. So off tank needs to taunt off at 9 stacks and then main tank taunts again when the off tank is at 9 stacks, etc, etc. The second ability is Inhale Blight. Whatever he inhales Blight, which happens approximately every 30 seconds, he will gain more melee damage and attack speed. When this buff reaches 3 stacks, he will start to hurt a lot and you should have cooldowns rolling on your tank at this point. After reaching 3 stacks, he will do 90% more damage and have 90% more attack speed for about 30 seconds before he casts Pungent Blight to release all the gas he has inhaled to deal massive damage to the entire raid. So how do we deal with this massive raid damage? 
spores. 20 seconds into the pull and every 30 seconds after, a gas spore will spawn in the raid. If you stand under these spores when they expire, you gain a stack of inoculated, which reduces your shadow damage taken by 25% for 2 minutes and it stacks up to 3 times and is removed when Pungent Blight is casted. In our raids, we have 3 camps assigned for this. One in melee, one in the left range camp and one in the right range camp. We use our two Holy Paladins in range as markers on where to stack for the spores. If more than one spore spawns in melee, obviously one melee player moves out to the missing range camp with the spore. The last two abilities we'll talk about now is basically personal responsibility stuff though. Just like the rot face fight, vile gas will spawn and it will spawn on three players. First one will happen about 10 seconds into combat and after that it will happen every 30 seconds. This means the ranged people again need to spread out in a range to not all get hit by this debuff and spread it to their friends. Two people too close to each other with this will usually result in both of them dying. This should not overlap though with the spore, so you'll be fine when it comes to that. The last ability is Malleable Goo. Malleable Goo is casted from Putticide Balcony around every 10 seconds. It shows a green puddle on the floor where it will land. Do not get hit by this ability. Dodge it by at least around 12 yards. And if you do get hit by this, you take massive damage and you have your casting and attack speed reduced by 250% for 20 seconds. The way my guild handles this in melee is to play it like we've been playing Algalon, which is everyone in melee stacks on any leg at the start and then every 10 seconds when Malibu is casted, we swap leg position even if it is not in melee since it is, can be hard to see it in melee. And uh, that's about it for Festergod. If a player in your raid missed a spore stack, you can make sure to shield them right before the explosion, give them hand sack with a bubble etc to make sure they live. It is possible to live with only two stacks, we've had that happen many times. I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one. Professor Puchicide has uh, three phases and two intermissions. Phase 1 is 100 to 80%, Phase 2 is 80 to 35%, and phase 3 is 35% until he's dead. The king of phase 1 and 2 in this fight, as you will be able to see in the footage rolling in the background, is the off tank controlling the mutated abomination. He will be topping DPS and it will not even be close with the strategy that we use. We use the off tank as basically as a damage dealer on this boss fight. The mutated abomination controller needs to make sure he has enough energy to slow the oozes that spawn and to instantly apply the armor debuff, other than that, you're just whacking away on, on the oozes and on the boss. Starting from 10 seconds into the fight, and after that every 30 seconds, Pucha's side will throw two slime puddles at two random players, creating a growing ooze at the location. This ooze is absorbed by the mutated abomination that we just talked about. On pull, we usually stack up at the table or to the left of the table to bait the stacks right here. Before the boss is moved under the green valve, ready for the first volatile ooze to spawn. About 25 seconds into the fight, Hutchish side will spawn his first volatile experiment and it will always be the volatile ooze first. By having the boss where the green slime spawns, all melee players will instantly be able to damage it when it spawns to kill it even faster. The Volatile Ooze will fixate on a target and root it in place and start moving to the target. When it reaches its target, it will explode and deal roughly 250,000 damage to surrounding enemies. This damage is split among every single raid member hit by it. You cannot slow the Ooze, only the Mutated Abomination can do this. Warlocks can pre-place a portal to extend the duration of when it will hit a player. All Warlocks should have a portal in the same position so when it targets a Warlock, everyone in the raid knows where to go when the Warlock uses the portal. Putricide will also cast Unbound Plague, an ability that increases your damage taken from it the longer you have it, and it jumps to nearby players. How we handle this debuff is to soulstone a designated player, we use our Resto Druid, rest in peace brother, 
and have him take the plague out and go die alone. We cycle through all our soul stones like this. After the green slime has been killed, you can push the boss below 80% HP to start the first intermission. During the intermission, Putuside will go to the table and spawn two volatile experiments, one green ooze and one orange ooze. The orange ooze is called Gas Cloud, and similar to the green ooze, it will fixate onto a target, however, it will not root it. But if it reaches its target, it will instantly kill it. If you don't kill the gas cloud in time, it will fixate onto a new target and repeat the process. When it is changing its fixate target, it is important to not be near it to not instantly get one shot. During this intermission, the off tank will be slowing and depiercing the oozes with the abomination, and the entire raid will receive a debuff either called ooze variable or gas variable. If you have ooze variable, you can only deal damage to the green ooze and you have gas variable, you can only deal damage to the gas cloud. If you are kiting the gas cloud, try to not kite it to the opposite side of the room, but rather keep it near the raid for more damage uptime and killing it faster. After 45 seconds, phase 2 will start. If you pushed him before the second slime spawn in phase 1, the first add that spawn now will always be a gas cloud. We are put aside positioned on the green valve when the gas cloud spawns, so no one is close to it to instantly get one shot. And then whoever gets fixated by the gas cloud kites it through Putricide, so all the melee can naturally switch to it and burst it down ASAP. In phase 2, he gains two new abilities. Malleable Goo, which is the same ability as on Fessagot, and Choking Gas Bombs. How we handle the Malleable Goo is to have the range stacked together in one stack, and then move either left or right on every Malleable Goo depending on the situation. Moving as one group re reduces the chances of a guy randomly walking into a malleable goo. For the choking gas bombs, the tank just moves put aside away from them when they spawn. And that's pretty much it for phase 2. At 35% you encounter your second intermission, which is a repeat of the first intermission. When phase 3 starts, you are on a DPS check timer. To kill the boss before either the entire room is covered in green slime, or your raid just takes too much damage and you die. In phase 3, the abomination will disappear and no longer be available to the raid. Putricide will still cast the green slime puddles, gas bombs and malleable goo. For this phase, we yet again have the entire range camp stacked together to bait the malleable goo in one spot and all the green slime in one spot as well. In Phase 3, Professor Putricide will now also apply a debuff to the tanks every 10 seconds called Mutated Plague. The Mutated Plague deals damage to the entire raid every 3 seconds and the damage is multiplied by 3 for every stack you have. How we handle this debuff in the last phase is our main tank takes 1 stack. Second stack that happens we have one of our DKs get handed protection by a Holy Pala and then he taunts the debuff so the main tank does not get a stack. After that, our off tank who was in the abomination taunts the boss and tanks until two stacks. Third stacks that would happen on the off tank is once again taunted by a DPS player, in our case the DPS warrior with a hand of protection. After this we have either main tank or off tank take it until the boss dies. If you don't have great DPS you might need more DPS players to help out with a taunt, but I hope you found the video useful and uh, best of luck with the fight in uh, Icecrown Citadel. Blood Council is a bit of a weird fight. It's not an end wing boss, but in my guild we found this boss to be even harder than Blood Queen who is the boss after Blood Council. Blood Council has three bosses, each with its own unique set of abilities. You can only deal damage that matters to the boss that is currently active. Dealing damage to non-active bosses does not do anything. On heroic mode, whenever you move you gain a stacking debuff called Shadow Prison. Only way to cleanse it is to not move for 10 seconds. Sorry to all the melee users using to spam strafe when attacking the boss, I feel you. Prince Valinar will always be the first boss active and he has two abilities. 
His first ability is Kinetic Bomb. He will spawn a Kinetic Bomb in a random location, and if the bomb hits the ground, it deals massive damage to the entire raid and pushes you back. To avoid it hitting the ground, it must receive a direct hit, and the way we handle these bombs is to have our two Affliction Warlocks and the one Hunter take care of them by sending their pets on them. There should never be four active bombs, and if there is, the first bomb is usually spawning a couple seconds after the fourth one have already spawned. His second ability is Shock Vortex. When Balanar is not the active boss, Shock Vortex will spawn a random on a random player in the room. Seen by a little swirling matter on the ground, just have everyone move away from this on the ground. When Valinar is the active boss, he will do empowered Shock Vortex, causing every player in the raid to deal damage and knock back anyone who is within 10 yards or closer. Getting hit by one is okay, two is where you start dying. This means when the empowered Shock Vortex happens, all range should be pre-spread and all melee needs to move out to a designated spot for this ability to not kill the entire raid. The second boss is Prince Kel Kelethat. I cannot pronounce that. And is usually tanked by the off tank. Kelethat is spawning a dark nucleus every 10 seconds. These balls will attach to the last player who attacked them and they slowly deal damage to themselves dying after some time. While they are attached to a player, that player takes reduced shadow damage but also takes a dot of shadow damage. This boss is not dangerous at all when he's not the active boss. But when he is the active boss and if your off tank does not have enough dark nucleus on him, he might just get one shot by the shadow lances. Make sure to not multi shot, don't have seal of command on and turn off any auto cleave from your fell guard etc as you don't want to damage these balls at all. Third boss is Prince Taldera. This boss is usually tanked by the main tank. Uh, it's not a dangerous boss until he becomes the active boss. Every 25 seconds, he will cast glittering sparks in the direction of a random raid member, applying a debuff that can be cleansed or master spelled. The debuff deals damage and slows you which can be very deadly if it happens right before an empowered shock vortex. When Taldoram is not active, his conjure flame is useless and doesn't matter. However, when he is the active boss and cast empowered conjure flame, the person targeted by this ability needs to kite the, the uh, empowered flame through other raid members to reduce the damage upon impact. In our raid, we usually stack all the range together and if a range gets targeted, they just go behind the range stack and it's usually fine. And uh, that's basically the entire boss. But do not underestimate this boss. It's quite easy to wipe here. Um, it is random for your ID as well, which boss becomes active at the second one. It is not known beforehand if it's the fire or the shadow boss. I hope you enjoyed the video though. And uh, good luck in Ice Crown Citadel. Blood Queen Lanathel is a fairly simple fight, so I'll try to keep it as short and precise as possible. On pull, you want to make sure that the main tank and off tank are the two people closest to each other, as she will cast a blood mirror on the main tank and whoever is closest to them. And this will mirror any damage taken from the main tank onto the linked target. For this boss, we have three melee camps, one behind the boss and one to each side of her. Everyone in range needs to spread out approximately 10-12 yards to not splash each other with the blood ball splash ability that the boss is casting every approximately 15 seconds. Around every 25 seconds, Blood Queen will cast the Pact of the Dark Fallen, linking three targets with a red beam, and these three targets need to meet up to remove this link. Careful not to meet up on squishy targets as you splash people around you with damage when you have the debuff. Around every 30 seconds, a player will be targeted by swarming shadows, which will leave fire behind you just like on Diraxis in TOC. Move to the wall ASAP and place it alongside the side of the wall to not fill up the room. The timer is quite spot on and if you are Death Knight, you can pre-cast Anti-Magic Shield 
And if you are the target of this ability, you don't get the debuff and you negate the entire ability. These abilities will happen throughout the entire fight. So now let's move on to the main ability of the fight, which is Vampiric Bite. Vampiric Bite will be cast approximately 10 seconds into the fight on any of the two top two threat people in the raid who are not tanks. Important to remember, this is not threat percent based, but rather your raw threat number based. The Vampiric Bite makes you do 100% more damage and heal yourself on attacks. After 60 seconds, you will enter a state of frenzied bloodthirst, where you must bite another player within 10 seconds or you will be mind controlled and lose the bite. Losing a bite early on is bad and will most likely result in you not meeting the DPS check. We delay the first bite a player does by around 5 seconds, so it lines up better with the air phase that Blood Queen will do later on in the fight. When you bite another player, they take a big chunk of physical damage. So if a bite needs to happen during the air phase, we have a hand of protection assigned in our raids from the paladins onto the target that's getting bitten so they don't get comboed down. After 2 minutes and 5 seconds of combat, the first air phase happens. When this happens, the entire raid will be feared. In this situation, having a pre-casted fear ward on the priest here is very good since they can dispel the fear with master spell on the raid. Tremor totems also work here guys. During our phase, she will be doing Blood Bolt Whirl, which is basically the Blood Bolt splash from earlier, but much, much more frequently. So it is very important that you use these axe and spread out here to not splash each other or I can guarantee you will die. The next air phase is about 1 minute and 40 seconds after the first one and you will not get a third one. If you do, you will just instantly die to the enrage anyway. That is basically the entire fight. A very straightforward enrage type, type of fight. To ensure the first bite goes on the right target, in my guild, we use one misdirection on our Feral Druid number 1 and one tricks on the Feral Druid number 2, while the rest of the misdirections or tricks goes to the main tank. If you have another method that works for you, stick with that one. I hope you enjoyed the video and good luck in Icecrown Citadel. Dreamwalker is a bit of a special boss, as most people consider it a freebie boss, but I still think, think that it deserves a quick little guide. On this boss, we basically have every single hybrid player in the raid respect to healer. We use 9 healers for this boss, 4 holy paladins, 2 resto druids, 1 resto shaman, 1 holy priest and 1 disc priest. All healers except for our disc priest will go inside the portals. This means all our outside players need to be careful with the damage they take as only one disc priest is healing the entire raid. Every 45 seconds, green nightmare portals spawn at random locations around the boss, which allows 8 people to enter in 25 men. When they open about 15 seconds later to allow people to pre-position, the people inside will enter a dream state for about 20 seconds where they are floating around touching green clouds. Each nightmare cloud will increase your healing done and give you MP5. On your heroic, you will also gain a stacking debuff called Twisted Nightmares which will give you a nasty dot the more dot stacks you have, forcing you to also heal yourself a bit. The best way to do this is to immediately pop the closest cloud near you to refresh your stack if you have a stack, and after that fly in a stack together to make the, make the most out of the limited amount of clouds inside. With our raid composition we are able to lust after the second portal room, and with the holy priest guardian spirit heal the boss to full HP after the second portal room. The reason we are able to lost and finish the boss after second portal room is the fact that we are using a hunter pit with the talent Blood of the Rhino, making the pit take 40% more healing. What then happens is our holy paladins will beacon Dreamwalker and heal the pit as the main target. The 40% increased healing on the holy light on the pit does not transfer a 40% bigger beacon heal, but your glyph of holy light splashes for more healing onto the boss so the pet needs to be positioned under the boss. For the outside team, there's five different types of adds on this boss. First add, 
Risen Archmage is not scary and you just casually damage it down. The second add is the Blistering Zombie. This zombie will kite with a hunter as you don't want to be tanking hits from this add. Hunter tanks it and kites it with slows while range dot it and kill it. Third add is the Gluttonous Abomination, a not so dangerous mob. Do not stand in front of this mob. When this mob dies, it will spawn Rotworms. These worms must be AoE down ASAP. If you see an Abomination spawn, it means that right after you will see the fourth add type spawn, which is the Suppressors. Six Suppressors will spawn. It can be anything from one to five on either side of the room. And these mobs, mobs must be your prior target when they're up as they reduce healing being done to Dreamwalker, making you kill her slower. They can be stunned and slowed. The fifth and last mob is the most dangerous of them all, the Blazing Skeleton. The Blazing Skeleton will spawn every minute and has 350,000 HP. The Blazing Skeleton has an ability called Lay Waste, which deals about 6,000 fire damage every 2 seconds to the entire raid including the boss. And when you have only one healer outside, this quickly gets out of control. So when this spawns, drop what you're doing and kill it ASAP. As long as you follow what I've said here, you should have a smooth Dreamwalker. If your healing is, is uh, lackluster or you, maybe you miss some stacks on the healers, you will need more than the two portal rooms. And that is it for this boss. Best of luck in Icecrown Citadel. Sendragosa is a two-phase fight. First phase is 100 to 35% and phase two is 35 till dead. Sendagosa has a ticking frost damage aura similar to the frost damage aura on Saffron in Naxxramas. In our raid, we use frost resistance enchants and items on our tanks, so not the raid itself. Our tanks are leather workers for the bracer frost enchant, they use cloak frost enchant and the tanking ring from Onyxia together with a frost resistance flask. Sendagosa also does a cleave a Tail Swipe and a Frost Breath, approximately every 20 seconds. Frost Breath will add a stacking, attack speed and movement speed slow. It cannot be dispelled, but abilities like Hand of Freedom will remove the entire debuff, making you not need to tank swap on this. Sendragosa has an armor buff called Permitting Chill, don't butcher me for how I pronounce that, which gives a chance for all physical attacks to stack a debuff called Chill to the Bone. Stacking of frost damage taken on a 2 second ICD. To drop this debuff you need to not attack for 8 seconds. Depending on the class or spec you play, you need to stop at either 5, 6, 7 stacks or never stop at all. Cloak of Shadows from Rogues will clear this debuff and abilities like Anti-Magic Shell will remove the ability of gaining new stacks while it's active as well. With Anti-Magic Shell and IBF, you can also soak a cast of Blistering Cold. Blistering Cold will happen about every 30 seconds into the fight and every 30 seconds after landing from each air phase. It will pull all players into melee and start casting Blistering Cold upon completion of the cast. It will deal about 60,000 damage on Heroic to anyone close to it. Hiding behind ice blocks does not save you from this ability in phase 3. For all casters in the raid, you have Sindragosa's ability called Unchained Magic. The first cast happens about 10 seconds into combat and then every 30 seconds after that. The debuff will be put on 6 random caster DPS players and healers. If you cast with this stack, you gain a stacking debuff creating a massive explosion of damage to enemies 20 yards in range of you. To combat this ability, we have pre-designated spread positions for this ability so you can stand in a spot and cast a spell every now and then without hitting other people. In the last phase of Syndragosa, we have players with deep buff never cast at all with no exceptions. Since the healers can get targeted by this ability, we once again make use of our hybrid classes and have our shadow priest go holy. So we play three holy paladins, one disc priest, one holy priest, one resto druid, and one rest of shaman. I have never seen unchained magic on more than three healers at a time, so this will always leave four healers still able to spam heal. Now, 
for the part that will probably wipe a lot of girls on progression, the air phase. First air phase happens about 50 seconds into the pull, and then 60 seconds after every time she has landed until phase 2 starts. No air phases during phase 2, and all caster DPS can keep damaging Cintragosa in the spot we're standing until the frost beacons go out. When the air phase starts, Cindragosa will choose 6 players to be frost beacons, and 7 seconds later, those targets will become frost tombs. We position our frost tombs as shown in this picture, with 2 beacons in each camp. There must be at least 10 yards between the tombs to not splash other ice tomb camps. The people targeted by frost beacons should be, should be healed to full, have a power shield uh, from the disc priest, and hots from any healer as they will take passive damage inside the tombs other than the big explosion on application. A D-Sack from the Paladin also helps a lot for this. Cindragosa will throw a total of 4 frost bombs during this phase, and the way to avoid them is to stand directly behind the frost tombs and the explosion. Standing a little to the side on a frost tomb etc will not help you and you will die. Think of only the tall point on the frost tomb as like a wall of safety. Each ice tomb has 450,000 HP and should be killed right after the last explosion have happened. To ensure clean killing on the tombs, dot classes should refrain from using dots and only use a non-dot ability so you don't overkill the tombs too early. That is pretty much all you need to know for phase 1. Just rinse, repeat, air phases and the debuffs until 35%. In our raids, we bloodlust on pull, as Cindragosa is not a DPS race and phase 2 is fairly simple as long as you play it right. In the last phase, we have all our DPS players except for the unholy DKs and devil warlocks use resistance flask, just like we did for Algalon in Uldua. You might not need to do this, but it's just extra safety and like I said, it's not a DPS race in phase 2, just play to survive and you will kill the boss. All the same debuffs from phase 1 still appears in phase 2, but now you will get a new stacking ability called Mystic Buffet every 6 seconds. This debuff increases all magic damage taken by 20% per stack for the next 8 seconds, and it stacks infinitely. This is the reason people would instability no longer cast at all in this phase in our guild. The way to clear this stack is that every 15 seconds, one player will be targeted by a frost beacon. Um, if you stand behind these frost tombs, you can clear your mystic buffet stacks. In our guild, we place our first tomb on the right side, second tomb left side, and as soon as the second tomb has spawned, we kill off the previous despawned one, so we never have more than one up at a time. This way, we just cycle between left and right, left and right, left and right. The stacking debuff does require you to do some tank swapping now. You can survive Frost Breath with heavy tank cooldowns up until 10 stacks, but after that you should have your off tank take over while you reset your stacks. Solo tanking can work with stacking a lot of frost resistance gear, but 2 tanking is safer. That is basically the entire boss fight. The enrage timer is a non-factor on this boss, so as long as you play to survive, you will be more than fine. I hope you enjoyed the video, and best of luck in Icecrown Citadel. Hey guys, and welcome to my Lich King 25 man heroic guide for Wrath of Lich King Classic. My previous guide videos, if you watched them, were focused around being as short and precise as possible, but for Lich King, I feel like I need to make it as in-depth as possible, as I feel like this would be the boss where most people will hit a brick wall and do progression for many many weeks. I will do segments for the boss, split up into phases and intermissions, so you can quickly navigate to a specific part of the boss you want to learn more about. In this strategy video guide, I will base it around the strategy used by my guild on progression release. Now just to make, make it clear, I am not saying this is the one and only way of killing the boss, but it is what works for us and hopefully works for some other people out there. Enough talk about that though, I'll get straight to it. First, I will speak about the composition we use for our Lich King progression. You don't need 
the composition we use here, but it's what worked for us. I will also upload a video after this showcasing us 24 manning Lich King, showing that, showing that you don't need the perfect calm for the boss. Our composition is a blood decay main tank, a protection pala off tank, we use 3 unholy DKs, 2 survival hunters, 1 fury warrior, 1 combat rogue, 1 red pala, 1 shadow priest, 1 feral, 1 bomi, 1 demo lock and 5 affliction warlocks. Our healing team is 3 holy paladins, 2 disc priests and 1 resto shaman. Having 3 unholy DKs, 2 survival hunters, 1 fury and 1 wretched pala ensures that the ghouls die at a good pace in phase 1 and having 6 warlocks and 2 hunters allows you to skip almost one third of all the Valkyrie spawning in phase 2. We are able to make the enrage timer with 6 healers, so we found no reason not to play it as safe as possible with 6 healers. Playing double disc priest ensures power shield on the entire raid for every infest, also having this many paladins in the raid ensures a raid cooldown for every single infest as well. We found that blood dk for tanking Lich King and protection pala for off tanking yielded the best results. Also having the blood dk tank allows you to get 10% attack power and 20% melee haste so you don't have to bring either Enha Shaman or Frost DK. If you have any other questions regarding the comp you can always ask me when I'm live on Twitch or in the comments down below. After launch though, I'll probably have a very limited time to be reading the YouTube comments, so for a faster response, catch me on twitch.tv slash technotv instead. Now, before you ask, keep in mind, our comp was as optimized as possible for a one-shot on launch. You can kill this boss with basically any comp. This is not a mandatory comp. Now that the comp section is done, let's get straight into the boss fight and start with phase one. Before phase one even starts, we have our Warlocks pre-position portals where we want to end Lich King in phase 1 so they get more uptime on the boss and can portal safety right before Remorse's Winter starts doing damage. We also have our Warlocks do Soul Stones before the pull as this is a 15 minute boss fight and you'll get a second use of Soul Stones later in the fight, more on this when we get to phase 3 though. In phase 1 there are 5 mechanics you need to be aware of, let's go through them one by one. The first ability is Infest. Infest will happen every 20 seconds. Infest deals a large amount of shadow damage to all players in the raid and the targets will take more and more shadow damage every second while the debuff is active. Only way to remove this debuff is to heal every target to 90% or higher HP. This is where the two disc priests come in clutch with pre-shielding every single player in the raid making it faster and easier to get people to above 90% HP. In our raids we cover every single infest with either a DSAC or an Aura Mastery Shadow Resist. This ability will also happen in Phase 2 but not in Phase 3. If you do lose a player during the fight, make sure to not take a Soul Stone or Combat Rest right into an infest, you will just get one shot. The second ability is Summon Drudge Ghouls. This ability happens on pull, and after that roughly every 30 seconds and it summons 3 ghouls near Lich King. These ghouls have 750,000 HP each and is passively being cleaved down by our Fury Warrior on Holy DKs, the Survival Hunter Traps and our Retribution Paladin. In our comp, these fellas doing a passive AoE is enough to kill them at a decent enough pace as to where no one has to stop their single target rotation to help with the AoE. These ghouls are being tanked mainly by one unholy DK doing the most damage to them um, and you want to try to keep them on one unholy DK to make it easier for the healers as well. Be wary of getting dazed though if you're the one tanking these ghouls because you might be too slow for the next ability. The third ability is summon shadow trap. Every 15 seconds Lich King will summon a shadow trap beneath a random player. This can be anyone in the raid including tanks. Upon landing, the trap will activate after a couple of seconds. If anyone touches the trap, it will explode and most of the time launch you and anyone close to it off the platform and you cannot be resurrected if you died falling off the platform. So avoid this trap at all costs. Whenever a trap is on the tank, we always had the melee go left side around the boss to uh, avoid it and not go through it. 
If you go through it and it's on the main tank and a DK is dazed by a ghoul, the trap will 100% be activated and all your melee players die. The fourth ability is the Summon Shambling Horror. The Shambling Horror will first spawn 10 seconds after the first ghoul wave and after that every 60 seconds. Now, a lot of videos and guides I've seen all tell you the same thing. You need to phase the Lich King into phase 2 before the third Shambling spawns. And that's just wrong. My guild and I never had the DPS to skip the third Shambling Horror and we have lich killed the Lich King during the PTR more times than I could count. So don't listen to this advice. The Shambling Horror is tanked by the off tank. And as you can see in the video being run in the background while I'm talking. And also by this picture, we are trying to form a triangle between the melee camp, rage camp and the Shambling Horrors. Every 20 seconds, the Horrors will enrage, causing them to deal 200% more damage. This ability must be dispelled as fast as possible by your hunters. We run two hunters, so we have a hunter assigned to each Shambling Horror to dispel it as fast as possible. When a Shambling Horror reaches 20% or lower HP, they gain Frenzy, giving them a lot of attack speed and doubling their damage dealt. This is a good time for defensive cooldowns like Shield Wall, Pain Suppression, Hammer of Justice Stuns, etc. As you can see in our videos, the way we handle the second and third Shambling Horror spawns is that we have one of our hunters angled in a position to distracting shot it when it spawns, so it comes in a good angle until the off tank taunts it off and the shamblers are now facing the same direction. The reason as to why you want to do that is because about every 20 seconds the shamblers will do a shockwave, dealing high damage that will almost always one-shot any non-tank hit by it. Now, these Shambling Horrors have 6 million HP each and you're not supposed to have anyone dealing damage to them. So how do you kill them? And how you kill them is with our 5th and last ability in Phase 1, which is Necrotic Plague. The 5th ability in Phase 1, Necrotic Plague, happens about every 30 seconds in the fight during Phase 1. Necrotic Plague deals 150,000 damage every 5 seconds for 15 seconds. and if the target it's on dies while affected by it, or if the effect just ends, the effect will gain an additional stack and jump to a nearby unit. If the effect is dispelled, it will also lose a stack and jump to a nearby unit. Whenever this effect jumps, Lich King will do 2% more stacking damage. This makes Lich King hit very hard at the end before you go into the intermission. How we deal with this plague is that with the triangle we're forming, both range camp and melee camp will be able to reach the off tank position where the shambling is and get dispelled before the 5 second passes. This is a great time to use rocket boots to ensure you get there in time. Dispel it as late as possible, unless you're closely watching the plague target, just make sure to dispel it before 5 seconds have passed or the player will die from the 150,000 damage tick. This will make the Necrotic Plague jump onto the Shambling Horror and when it times out from the Horror it will bounce back onto the off tank which then can dispel himself to get it back onto the Horror again. And when all the Shambling Horrors are dead you just dispel Necrotic Plague when no one is around you and it will just be gone from the raid. That will conclude phase 1 and how we deal with this phase. We lost on pull in this phase by the way as we'll get a second loss for later in the fight, since the fight is just that long. Now, let's move on to the first intermission. When the Lich King reaches 70% HP, he will go to the middle of the platform and start his cast of Remorseless Winter. We try to end phase 1 in a position where casters and melee are close to the edge of the platform, since Remorseless Winter deals damage to the entire center of the platform with unhealable damage. First intermission lasts 60 seconds. Warlocks who have pre-placed their portals can in this case refresh their dots and portal to safety right before the first take of damage happens to get as much damage as possible onto the Lich King. It is a very very tight in rage timer so every bit of damage really counts here. About 5 seconds after Remorse's winter starts and every 20 seconds after that, a raging spirit will spawn from a random player. Each Raging Spirit has 4.15 million HP 
and will do an ability called Soul Shriek, which deals 45,000 damage in a cone in front of them on Heroic. Do not be in front of these mobs. A trick we found to be useful is that if you have any, for example, Torin players in your raid who can use a Savior Deviate Delight, it makes the hitbox smaller if they do get targeted as a Raging Spirit, making the cone smaller as well, which is why our Blood DK main tank uses this instead of the Torin default form. A total of three spirits will spawn, and you would like for at least two of them to be dead before the intermission is over. During the intermission, the Lich King will also cast an ability called Pain and Suffering, targeting a random member and anyone standing near the target, which is why we have created three camps total to make healing easier. Other than that, the Lich King will also spawn Ice Spears spawning from him, that fixate on a target and pulls frost damage around that target. The person targeted by this should move and make sure you are not splashing damage upon the other raid members. The spears have a low HP pool of 54,000 HP and we usually have our hunters take care of these with the Boomy and Shadow Priest being backup. If the spears touch a player or reaches his target, everyone nearby will be knocked off the platform just like the Shadow Trap, so don't let that happen. If you have similar raid DPS to our raid, Second phase will start with the third spirit being hopefully around 80% HP. The tank of your choice, we chose the Blood Decay, will now take this Raging Spirit near the middle but face it away from the raid, so it can be multi-dotted and cleaved down during phase 2. You're not in a rush to kill it, but all dots and some focus damage on it is completely fine to kill it faster so the tanks can do some tank swapping. Now though, we're ready for phase 2. Phase 2 is known as the Valkyr phase and this phase is probably the point where most skills will be wiping and stock for a while. 10 seconds after phase 2 starts, infest will start happening like it did in phase 1. 15-ish seconds after phase 2 starts, you'll receive your first wave of Valkyries. My advice for the Valkyries is to have an auto marker for them and have some soft assigned DPS priority for them. You want to kill them evenly and spreading damage as evenly as possible. If a player is picked by a Valkyr and thrown off the edge, they cannot be resurrected again. Three Valkyrs will spawn one by one every 45-ish seconds and grab a random target. They cannot target tanks. For this phase, Warlocks should have repositioned their portals at the edge, since a Valkyr grabbing them can be ignored since the Warlock can portal back onto the platform. Hunters can also disengage back onto the platform if a priest or mage gives them slow fall so they have it when the Valkyrie releases them. Doing it without slow fall is never going to be reliable from what we found. Have your warlocks and hunters standing away from the melee stacks of Valkyrs so it's easy and fast to see that those Valkyrs are safe and not to be touched. Valkyrs need to be damaged to 50% before they will release the targets they picked up. How we specifically deal with the Valkyrs is we have an auto marker marking the Valkyrs with pre-assigned Hammer of Justice from our Paladins. So we Hammer of Justice into AoE stuns with Holy Wrath. We are ensuring them to be slowed the entire way with our one rogue, god bless him, doing crippling poison weapon swap with Shiv on all three Valkyrs. If the rogue is grabbed, however, we will use pre-used Hunter Slow Traps to slow the Valkyrs, but these are not as reliable as the Crippling Poison. Slows like Warrior, AoE Slow, etc. can be overridden and removed by any other slow, and we found it to not be useful at all for this. The tank should be kiting Lich King on top of the Valkyries that you are killing to ensure more cleave damage being dealt onto him as well. After all the stuns have happened, and if the slow isn't enough to break the people in the Valkyrie's free in time, you can use stuns that are not sharing DR with any other stuns, such as Cheap Shot and Infernals. If you have a singular Valkyrie that will not be killed in time, you can have the Rogue pool energy to vanish and to Cheap Shot it. But if you have multiple, having pre-assigned Infernals is a great way to deal with the Valkyries, which is what we do. We use a raid icon marker as a stacking point in melee, where every single player in melee needs to be standing, except for the tanks of course. This ensures all the Valkyries are traveling in the exact same line, and therefore are much easier to cleave down. 
while the Valkyries from previous waves will go above the Lich King, they will start to heal to full HP using Life Siphon on random players. We found that the Valkyries have an aggro table still. And for example, if a Warlock have aggro on too many, he can Soul Shatter or another player can call for salvation from a Paladin, since having aggro from too many of them can hurt a lot when it's combined with stuff like Infest. Now, I wouldn't say that Valkyrs are the main reason people wipe here, but instead a new ability that will be present during Phase 2 and Phase 3, which is Defile. Around 35 seconds after Phase 2 starts and every 35 seconds after that, the Lich King will target a random raid member to cast Defile on them, and yes, this ability can go on the tanks. When the Defile cast ends, it will leave behind a big pool on the ground and anyone touching the pool will make it grow really fast. If just one player is touching the pool, the pool will soon cover the entire platform and causing an instant wipe. How we handle the file in my guild is to pre-spread before every defile, making sure we can put it away from the raid and if needed we can use a rocket boost to get out with it faster. This ability has wiped my guild more times than I can count, so respect this ability and pre-spread for every defile. Every 30 seconds, the Lich King will now also cast a new ability, the ability that will kill most tanks on this fight, which is Soul Reaper. This ability deals massive damage and applies a debuff on the tank that will deal damage over 5 seconds, dealing 70,000 shadow damage while also giving the Lich King 100% attack speed for 5 seconds. Having tank cooldowns for every Soul Reaper and massive healing from your Holy Paladins is required every time this ability happens. This is also a great time to swap tank swap if the Raging Spirit is dead at this point. Once the debuff is applied, just swap tank to not get the huge burst of damage on one target. And uh, that's about it for phase 2. Phase 2 ends as soon as the Lich King reaches 40% HP. He will, like at the end of phase 1, run towards the middle, cast Remorseless Winter again. However, this time the outer platform is broken at the current point. So you have to get to the edge and be ready to jump onto the rebuilt platform. You can jump right before the Lich King finishes his cast to not take any taking damage on anyone in the raid from the Remorseless Winter. Now, for the second intermission. It's the same basis as the first intermission, except this time around four Raging Spirits will spawn instead of three. I won't go into detail here, as this entire intermission is already explained in the first intermission. When the second intermission ends, you would like the first two Raging Spirits to be dead, and with the third one as low as humanly possible. And now we start phase 3. At the start of phase 3, about 10 seconds after the intermission has ended, Lich King will cast his first Harvest Soul. In our kills, we will always kill the third Raging Spirit, but leave the fourth one alive for the off tank to handle for the rest of the fight. Killing another Raging Spirit with 4 million HP just seems unnecessary and you're already on a tight enrage timer. Off tank handling 2 for the rest of the fight is a bit scary though, so we don't do that, but you can do that if you want to. Now, before the first Harvest Soul happens, which will drain your entire raid and put you into a new room, you can use this time for all dot passes to put your dots on the Lich King and the Raging Spirit. First off, let's cover what still happens in this phase. Soul Reaper still happens every 30 seconds on the tank, and Defile still happens about every 35 seconds from phase starting. Lich King will no longer cast Infest, so it's a lot less healing intensive on the entire raid. First, let's discuss the first of the two new abilities the Lich King will do in this phase. Like previously mentioned, the Lich King will do Harvest of Souls at the start of phase 3. He will suck you into what is referred to as the Frost Morn phase. In here, there will be wicked spirits in the air and bombs spawning randomly in the room and on players. The goal is to kill these wicked spirits, not letting any of them reach you, while dodging all the bombs falling from the air. How we handle this fight 
is to mark our tank with an easy to see raid marker, which we'll use the orange one, and he will guide us to victory while all the ranged kill stuff in the air and healers can fully focus on healing while stacking on the orange marker. This phase lasts about 40 seconds and you'll most likely see 4 of these rooms in your kill. After every room has ended, the Lich King will cast the file on any raid member right away, so as soon as you get out, make sure to pre-spread instantly and keep the middle section clear as we want to use this for kiting later. Try to pre-spread the file to the side of the room that your off tank is not using for tanking the Raging Spirit. 10 seconds after getting out of the room, the first cast of Vile Spirits will happen, which is a new ability in Phase 3. This ability is a channeled ability that summons 10 Vile Spirits, which have 270,000 HP each. Now, I know there are strategies out there used by guilds to burst these Vile Spirits down as soon as they spawn with AoE abilities and therefore not moving Lich King at all, but this is not something we have practiced at all why we're not using this strategy. Our main tank is having the Lich King as close as possible to the edge to spawn the Vile Spirits here. And as soon as the cast is over, he will start running to the far opposite side of the platform. When Lich King reaches the other side of the platform, you would like the third Raging Spirit to be dead at this point so you can fully focus on the Lich King. Coming out of the first Frostmode phase, we also choose to use our Bloodlust as we found this time to be the best for it during phase 3. When you arrive at the other side, make sure to do a small pre-spread and this is about the time the second defile in phase 3 will arrive. The vile spirits that you spawned on the other side of the room will now fixate on random targets and if they reach any player, they will explode for massive damage around them, approximately 36,000 damage in 25 man heroic. So, how do we deal with those spirits? Is that when we run to the other side of the platform, we had a hunter lay down a slow trap and you trigger this trap with Lich King while running. Then we have the entire raid stack at Lich King as close as possible to the edge, while our Shadow Priest soaks the Vile Spirit with the Dispersion Glyph. If the Shadow Priest does not get all of them, we usually have our off tank, who is only tanking one Raging Spirit at this point, taunt one or two and soak it with a defensive. We also use backup soakers in the form of Feral Druid or Death Knights, as they can soak quite well with their own cooldowns, such as Bark Skin, Survival Instinct, Anti Magic Shield, etc. A Retribution Paladin or Holy Paladin can also help with a bubble soak. While these have been soaked, Lich King will have channeled another set of Vile Spirits. And as soon as the previous wave of Spirits have been soaked, the main tank will start running in a rapid phase as far as he can without griefing his healers to gain distance before the next Harvest Soul happens. When the next Harvest Soul happens, you want to yet again put the file in a good position and keep going to the edge of the other side as soon as possible for soaking easier and to spawn the next Vile Spirits close to the edge again. This is basically the entire Phase 3. We found that usually entering Phase 3, while you have at least 5 minutes and 45 seconds ish left on the Enraged Timer, will allow you to always get 4 Frostmon rooms and after the 4th Frostmon room, you can be kiting the boss around with taunts like you see in the video, while still killing him even though he's actually enraged. If you don't make this 5 minute 45 ish second timer, he will enrage before the fourth harvest soul and one shot your entire raid. And um, that's about it for phase 3. During the most of the PTR, it was possible to use stuff like combat dresses and soul stones to die prior to harvest uh, souls and then resurrect and do full damage into the Lich King while your raid was still playing the Frostmourne room. Blizzard made a custom change, even though there's videos even back from 2010 showcasing this strategy. Um, that the Lich King is now taking 99% reduced damage together with his Raging Spirit during the Frostmon room. Making it a not so valid strategy anymore. Although, it can still be used by Affliction Warlocks and I will explain why. If you die on the Harvest Souls by removing your buffs and spamming Life Tap a bit before, or simply standing still inside the Frostmon room and dying to bombs, then taking your Soulstone outside will allow you to buff up with necessary things like 
Drums of Kings, Drums of the Wild, while pre-stacking three stacks of Shadow Embrace with all dots up and pre-casting an Infernal, giving you the ability to do as much damage as possible with only lacking your food buff as soon as the raid is starting to kite him. Now, this is not necessary at all, and if you do it or not, it's up to you, but it's something you can do. Phase 3 ends when the Lich King reaches about 10.4% HP and he will cast Fury of the Frostmourne to kill your entire raid. About 2 minutes and 40 seconds later, Tyrion will resurrect your entire raid and you can now finish off the last 10% of its HP. And uh, that will conclude the Lich King. I hope I remembered to mention everything that I find important for this fight. I know this video probably ended up being incredibly long, but I feel like this is justified for a fight this hard going in depth of what we do every single phase and I think it should help a lot of guilds or pucks out there. If you do have any questions about this and I didn't cover it in the video, feel free to leave a comment and I'll try to get to it ASAP. I may however be super busy with the release of ICC and not have as much time for YouTube comments right now. So instead come say hello on twitch.tv slash techno tv and ask any questions while I'm live. You may also join my discord to find my UI or ask any questions. It is linked in the description of the video. Best of luck in Icecrown Citadel to all of you and thank you for watching my video.